I'm so glad that you could join us for uh, this part of our series, the second part, as we are looking at Awestruck. And um, I was looking for a title that would um, really catch us in, uh, if you will, kind of catch us off guard a little bit. It, it's it's uh, so often uh, a concern, you know, of lots of pastors when whenever you preach Christmas, it, it's almost like, well, we've heard it, you know, and and uh, we kind of move into a different level or, you know, because we can mix Jesus and Santa and uh, Rudolph and, you know, and we can just keep going. And all of a sudden we've got this incredible picture of Jesus, you know, lying in the manger with Santa and it's beautiful. But we can also get very fragmented and I'll be honest with you sometimes uh, just a little off course in what that means. And what I want you to know is this, this moment of the birth of Christ it, it, is, it is awestruck. I mean, it, it, the idea of awestruck that I'm going to explain to you today is having your mind blown. That, that's, and that, that's not always an easy thing to do when we talk about something that we're all engaged in at some level. It may be more secular, it may be more spiritual, whatever, but uh, anyway... That's my heart for you. That's what we've been praying for, and especially been praying for you, whoever would watch us online. We love that you're watching with us and worshiping with us, and, uh, and also right here, um, that, that, that today you might be awestruck in something that might just catch you off guard in the text, in the reading of God's word, as we think about these things, about the powerful concept of a baby among us, and then also the, powerful, the power of miracles. Okay? All right. So let's pray. Father, speak. Open our, our minds and our hearts to hear something that would ignite within us the very reality of your love. In Christ's name, amen. All right. So let's, be, let's begin with the question. Do you believe in miracles? <clears throat> you don't have to say anything. You don't have to raise your hand. <clears throat> it's not a test. Uh, online, it's, it's, it's not a test. It's more right now. I want you within your heart Within your mind, do you believe in miracles? And I want you to really take it. I want you to take it to heart. Do you believe in miracles? When I was in Houston and you guys were lifting me up with prayers and texts and all kinds of wonderful, wonderful um, notes of, of, of love and, and you were sustaining me in that time, um, on the third day of treatment, you know, it was radiation and, uh, and it wasn't very long to be honest with you, but it just kind of, Fatigue, it just knocks, kind of knocks your socks off. And so, uh, so I, I went back to the room. I could tell you everything in that room, by the way, because I was in it for 14 days. But, um, but I, uh, I went to lay down. I always went to lay down afterwards just to kind of rest. And so, so I'm resting, and, um, you know, it was during the World Series. So, you know, at least at night I could watch the Braves and the, uh, the Astros and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I want to tell you this real quick. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I just want you to hear this part. Um, I'm lying in bed, and it's about three hours before the game, and I get a text from one of our members who is going to heaven, and, um, and the text read, Hayes, would you like a ticket to the World Series, because it was game two in Houston, and it said, would you like a game, w- would you like a ticket to the World Series? I text back, because I was thinking, am I tired or should I go? And I went, this is God's will. <laughs> this is a miracle of God. And so I immediately text back and said, oh yeah. And uh, I, I, I might have walked in the game, you know, like this, but I went in. And, uh, uh, but anyway, so I, I get a ticket from this, this person in our church. And uh, so I go and you know, get over there um, by myself, but that's fine, and, and uh, uh, you know, that, that was fine, and you, uh, I don't go there to visit when you watch ball games anyway, and, um, and so I, I was, uh, the ticket was great, it was behind third base where the Braves were, um, and just so you know, it was the night the Braves would lose, so that was not exciting if you watched that game or if you were in Houston, uh, I was sitting there behind third base, it was fantastic, and uh, so anyway, I'm I get an aisle seat. So this is the second miracle. Because if you don't know me, you aisle people, I know you. You want out. I know you. I know you. You want out. And so I want out. I'm like, yes. I was texting that guy going, I love you. I just worship the ground that you walk on. And, and, uh, and then you know it happened. 
because it's happened to you. Out of the corner of my eye, that long aisle, here they come. You know how you sit on an airplane and you're by yourself and it's looking good and then here comes somebody and you're like, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I mean, your spiritual tone goes deep. It goes deep. Lord Jesus, no, no. And then boom, they plop it right there, right? Hey, how are you? You want to talk the whole time we're flying? No, not really. No, not really. So, so I'm praying. I go into a spiritual mode. Lord, Lord, I've been, you know, I'm three days in. I'm exhausted. I just want to watch the game. Plop. So I just want to tell you, this guy was huge. He was not a little man. He was a big man. Not very pretty either, okay? So he's big. He's big. He's big. Do you understand? And so the seat's about like that, and he's big. Okay. I'm in my seat doing great. And so he, he's trying to get in. The guy next to him, I think, is his son, who, as big as he is, but like a teenager and a little socially awkward, loud yelling and all that kind of junk. And uh, no, no, I don't mean for the, I mean anything. He yelled at anything. And then a woman, and I ignored her. All right. So, so, so we're right here. And I'm talking to God because I had a miracle. I had two miracles, two miracles, you know. And uh, so anyway, long story short, this is all I'll tell you is it, uh, all, it, it, all it did was it was a wonderful night and really had a ball. I had a ball. But this guy was on his phone. And every time he would get, uh, oh, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this because this, you'll be so surprised at your pastor. And then I got to move on. Okay. He, uh, he sat down. I don't know what we had done. We, I think we got up for something. And so, you know, me, I like got up. And then he sat down. And, uh, and I think I went to get a Coke. And I came back. And so when I come in, I thought he would slide his big old leg to let me sit. No. No. So your pastor slammed that seat. And I was hurting. And I just sat. And he wouldn't move his legs, so I got a little bump. And then finally, he just moved that thing. And I just looked him over like, you're not going to make it to heaven. You know, I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to make it to heaven. And so anyway, long story short, we, uh, the game goes, he gets, he gets on his phone. You know, you cell phone people. Um, he gets on it. I'm kidding. We all got cell phones. And, uh, but he, would, he took phone calls the whole night. So he would, the game's going on. Astros are winning. He'd get his phone, and then he'd cut right in front of the man on the aisle, which happened to be me. So he would cut, and a big man couldn't get by unless I got up. He just couldn't get by. There was no way. So I got, I just want you to know, I probably got up about 32 times. And I also want you to know, that was a miracle too, (laughs) that I could get up 32 times. Anyway, you know how sometimes you pray for a miracle, and, and the miracle is like incredible, spectacular, wonderful. And then you sometimes pray for a miracle. You don't see it as a miracle, but it was a miracle. And that's where I want you to think about this, okay? Here's my question to you. Do you believe in miracles? Now, here's the next question. Do you believe in the supernatural intervention power of God? Now, now I really want you to think about it. Do you believe? Do you believe God? Now, this is so important. Do you believe God at his time, according to his purpose, can bend the direction of history for his purpose, for his glory? Do you believe it? Do you believe in miracles? I'm not talking about hocus pocus religion. I'm not. That's not who I am. I'm not talking about abracadabra kind of preacherism. I'm not. That's not who I am. So I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you do you believe that God can direct supernatural power for your, for your supernatural good and for mine? That's what I'm asking. Now, some of you, I know you're going, well, I want to. And when you're battling an illness, you're battling cancer, you're battling heart disease, you're going through something maybe with a child or a parent, uh, someone you love that's in an ICU or whatever, you know, your, your thought is today, I want to, I want to believe that. 
When I, so often in the summertime, you know, you look out at the farmers and there's a drought and you know, you, you know their spirits are crushed at times and you just see them and, and they'll say the same thing. I need a miracle. I want, you know, I want to believe. We long to believe in a, in a great God, don't we, who moves out of the ordinary of life to reveal his character in our lives. But you see, so, so if I ask you, do you believe in miracles? You'd say, well, I want to. And then the next statement for some of us is this. Well, we're a little cautious. You know, we're, we're just a little cautious. And the reason why we're cautious is we're disappointed with God. And then someone had the audacity to say to you, you just need to have a little more faith. When they say that to you, just gently put your hand around their neck and then squeeze. No, 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 no. Do not do that. Do not do that. But when they say that, oh my Lord, my heart breaks. You just need a little more faith. You just need a little more faith. You just need to be quiet. I mean, really. If that's all you got to say, be quiet. And so people are, you know, so people then all of a sudden are very, well, did I not know the word? I'm supposed to pray? Well, what's, what's the deal? What happens, you know? And so we're cautious because we're disappointed. It didn't, it didn't go the way we thought, right? For some of us. And then you read the Bible, and this is good stuff, and that's what I want to show you right now. And then you go to the Word of God, and when you go to the Word of God, even after your discouragement, whatever it is, you go to the Word of God, and all of a sudden, you begin to read these passages that are incredible. Here, watch these, okay? Let's take a look real quick. We're going to run through them quickly. Matthew chapter 4. News about Jesus spread all over. Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and everybody said, what's this word? And he healed them all. Now, you and I, that, I'm just telling you when you read scripture, that's the moment we get excited, and nowadays it's like, and he healed them all. What's wrong with y'all? Well, I've seen a lot of TV. I mean, this is like unbelievable. All right, let's look at the next one. But he said to them, why are you afraid? Matter of fact, insert your name right here. Matter of fact, I'll put mine. Why are you, hey, why are you afraid, Hayes? Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. That's about accurate. Thank you, God. And then he arose, Jesus arose, and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So he looks at the disciples, and he looks at disciples like you and me, and he says, why are you guys so afraid? Hayes, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid in this dilemma? Why are you afraid in these moments of no answers? Why are you afraid? And he calmed it all, and there was this peace. Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes. There were people that were gathered that were sick and he immediately, immediately, folks, they received their sight and followed him. Immediately, imme- right then in that moment. It's powerful. It's unbelievable. Okay? When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. Really, I just got to ask you, how many of you walk on water? I really need to know. Would you lift your hand? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Walking on, you guys are in a hurry. Go back. All right. Walking on the water. They know how long I'm preaching, so relax. Walking on the water, and they were frightened. So they were like, They go from, you get this? You go from an incredible miracle moment. This is what we do so often. Something will enter our mind, the devil, Satan, to say, hey, was that real? Was that really what, you know, God wanted to do? Was that really? Because this happens. God will give you a miracle. God will give you some type of response. He might even bend human history for you. And all of a sudden, we're like, well, was that really God? 
All right, let's move on. Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, we're talking about Jesus, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and they begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him, they were made well. I mean, as many as touched him, they were made well. And then go on where I think we'll go to John. Yep. And look at this. Jesus did so many other things as well. John's telling you all about the life of Jesus in the last chapter. He says, if every one of them, of all these things and miracles that he had done, if, any, if all of them were written down, he says, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. It is unbelievable all that Jesus has done. And I want you to, to kind of wrap this in your mind. Jesus does not heal, does not bring miracles just on occasion. He does not do that. It is constant. That's what you read in scripture. They're not marginal miracles. They are essential miracles in our lives. The miracles are not suggestions. They're not that. The miracles are the building blocks of the identity of Jesus in your life. That's pretty good. You might want to write that one down. The building blocks of Jesus in your life. And now I want to bring you to a text for us today. Okay? It's in Isaiah. If you don't know much about Isaiah, Isaiah basically deals with almost like three generations. And so you can get lost and caught up in all that scholarly stuff. And that's fine. I, you know, we can do that one day if you want. Um, but, but no one will be in church that day, I'm pretty sure. But Isaiah is a great writing. And, it's, it's, uh, and so most people say there might have been three Isaiahs. We're not going to get into all of that right now. The timing and the dating. And it's, it deals with, you know, three contextual situations and all that. Okay? So I, I know all that. I, I've been to school. But, but I want you to know, Isaiah also speaks a language, a prophecy of God to a direct group of people who need to hear it. And God bends human history for those people, for supernatural good. And so, if you know anything about this, I, want, I just want you to remember, Kyle did a great job setting this up last week. He did a great job. And if, if you remember in Isaiah, and he, even, he spent a little time on verse 2, but Isaiah chapter 9... Remember what's going on in this context. Just don't forget this, okay? The northern kingdom uh, is, is, uh, has kind of signed up with Syria. And they want, they know Assyrians, the Assyrians are coming and they are powerful. And they're scared to death. And so they go to the southern kingdom, which is Judah. All right? Remember, he said this last week. And his name is King Ahaz. And King Ahaz, the reason why they go and they want to all get together is because, get this, get this, the northern kingdom in Syria, they don't know if God's with them. But they know God's going to be with Judah. And so they want to go over there to Ahaz and say, hey, we need a little help. We're about to face a giant in our lives, and we need some help. And so now... This is Ahaz's response. No, no, I'm sorry. This is really uh, Isaiah's response to that need. Okay, God, really it's God's, God's uh, prophecy. This is a prophecy. Here you go. You ready? The prophecy of God. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. All right, so there are some who believe and we're not going to get wrapped up in it, but there are some who believe that the child was Hezekiah. He's a great king after Ahaz. And I know that, so those of you who love that part, that's great, but I'm not one of those who believes it's Hezekiah. I believe it is the voice of Jesus. I believe this is the prophecy of God to fulfill the coming of the Redeemer in your life and mine. And I think this is how God will bend human history so that you and I can experience the supernatural goodness of God. So, we move on. A child's coming, and he will be called, would you say him with me? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
prince of peace. These are the names of that time period used to declare greatness of a king. These are the names. Not, not Brandon, sorry. That, that was not a name you used back then, they'd cut your head off, all right. But they, these were the names that they gave to a king that would come, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the attributes of God. And this describes the birth and the character of who Christ is is, get this, a baby among us. And this baby will come 700 years later. You think you've had to wait on something? Yeah, tell me about it. 700 years. And a baby will come and change the world. And I'll show you how the prophecy is fulfilled in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I'm giving you some good Bible. I'm hoping you're writing it down. He will be great and will be called, this is Jesus. He will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Prophecy fulfilled. Prophecy fulfilled. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. Prophecy fulfilled. And his kingdom will never end. And you know why this was said? Do you know why in this moment Luke tells us that? It's for this purpose and this purpose alone. That the only king who could reign forever. The only king who could reign forever. Is the one who would live forever. I mean this is, this is it. The only king who could reign forever is the one who would live forever. And this is what they're saying. This is the announcement of the miracle for all of us. And Israel, go back now. Israel was looking for an immediate remedy. And you and I do too. And sometimes the miracle is a journey and a process. It is. But I'm going to tell you when the miracle comes, it lasts forever. It lasts forever. So here's two things I want to remind you of very quickly. Jesus performed miracles in his day. I know you're all going, duh, duh, I've read the Bible. Well, you've read some of the Bible. Okay. Jesus performed miracles in his day. Why do you have to tell me that? Because the Bible's word, the word of God is very, very clear. And this is the one thing you cannot miss. One of the things that the enemy all the enemies of Jesus, what they really wanted to do while he was on earth is they wanted to show his, his, really his inability to provide miracles. It was really important to them to say, look, so he didn't do, look, he didn't do, look. That was their hope. The enemies of Jesus wanted to show his inability to provide power in these miracles. And they could not do it. This was their struggle. I want to show you one. After 50 days of the resurrection, after Jesus had died, resurrected, 50 days after the resurrection, get this now, in the book of Acts, you will find that Peter is preaching in Jerusalem, and he's preaching mighty good. And there are thousands of people, can you believe this? Thousands of people listening to Peter. Unheard of. And Peter is preaching away about the power of Jesus. Watch this now in Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, I mean, he's going at it. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, a baby among us who grew into a man who what? Brought miracles, who is the very revelation of God's character to the world, attested by God to you by what? I'm sorry, what? By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through Jesus in your midst. And look at this, as you yourselves also know. Now, Peter, I'm going to tell you right now, just kind of give you a little help. Peter, this is probably the first preacher who had a three-point sermon. And that's why I don't use it. I like 42 or whatever, but... He, he's, he's a three-point preacher. He used miracles, wonders, and signs. Isn't it great? 
And, and I mean, Peter is going at it. And then this is what he says. If you really want to know that Jesus is real, look at the miracles. Look, look at the miracles. And so he, he begins, you know what miracle meant in that day in the first century Greek? It meant power, dunamis. It meant dynamite power. It meant explosive. A miracle was not like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me a parking spot at Walmart. That's awesome. Got a, I got a miracle. That's not how it was seen in the first century. In the first century, it was wow. And he said, Jesus attests to miracles. And then he said, and then it leads to wonders. Wonders in the first century, a Greek means to have your mind blown. It's kind of like this. You, you, you experience something in your life that sets your heart ablaze. And then you go, <sighs> you don't even have to say a word. Because now your mind is blown by what he's done in your life. And then the signs in Greek were only a concept to point you to the one who did it. And so Peter says, God has already shown us who this person is. A baby among us now is the very son of God who is revealed with miracles, wonder, or wonders, and signs. This is the very reality of who Christ is. Now, after that, we have to look at the verse one more time because this is the part that blows my mind. I am awestruck by this, and I don't want you to miss it. Acts chapter 2. We're going to just look at it one last time. Please don't miss it. Men of Israel, I want you to hear these words. This is Peter. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, a man who fulfilled with miracles the power, the supernatural power of God, bended human history for you, brought wonders so that you're like so unbelievably moved by it, so inspired by it, that then what? The signs always lead you to Jesus, and then you will always lead people to Jesus. All right, now watch this. And this is the part, I'm going to tell you now, this is where you ought to just use this all week, which God did through Jesus in your midst. He's talking to the people in Jerusalem. Now watch this. As you yourselves also know. And then, as a good preacher, you know what he did. He paused. That's what good preachers do. Why did he pause? I know he paused. I know he did. I know that's what Peter did. I can read the Bible. I can feel it. Can't you? Some of you, I could barely get you to look at the Bible. But I read the, I can tell you right now, when he did that, he paused. And you know why he paused? He wanted to see, I'm telling you the truth. He wanted to see, is anyone going to argue? Don't you love that? I don't pause for that. I don't want you going, oh, I don't believe that. But Peter's a little bit stronger. And Peter, there, he's waiting to see, does anybody want to disagree with this? Does anybody want to disagree with what I just said? And so it's quiet. Can you picture this? Now listen, there's 3,000 people about to get baptized. So you know you've got 3,000 plus what? Two or three, four, five thousand. I mean, there's thousands of people listening to this message. He pauses and he says, as you yourselves also know. And this is what he's saying. You don't have to read a book to know about Jesus. It's only 50 days after the resurrection. You know him. You've seen him. You know him. And you've seen him. You know and Peter's going, and I know. It's, it's such a powerful moment. And then there's quiet, and no one argues. No one. Like, well, I don't know. Who, you, know you, you would think somebody would have done that. No one does that. 
No one does that of these thousands of people. And now I want, don't, don't lose the story in your heart. Don't lose the story. Now I want you to picture this. Someone raises their hand. And he's got a tear or tears in his eyes. And he says, I can only walk today because Jesus touched me. I know him. And someone else raises their hand and says, I know him too. And says, I was blind, but he touched me and now I can see. I know him. A leper raises both hands and they are well. And he's crying and he says, I know him. I know him. And I gave him my life and he healed me. Such powerful moments. Powerful for you and for me. And so the reason there were 3,000 people that day that got baptized is not because he preached a great sermon, but because supernatural power was in that moment. So here's the other thing I want you to remember, okay? God's, God's, uh, perform, God performs miracles in our day. I, I know you're going, yeah, I know that, Hayes, but real quick, all right, real quick. If we read the Bible, and I want to encourage you to do it, because I, I mean, do you see how in that moment, how that, if, if you really were with me, how that scripture passage comes to life, not because I did it, but because God is telling us something today, how it just comes to life. So if we read the Bible, and what Jesus did back then, I know we're amazed, I know we are, but here's what I want you to understand. This is the most important point today. Here we go. What God did then, he does now. What God did then, he does now. John 14, verse 12. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. You believe in me, and you'll do the works I've been doing. And they will do even greater, here we go, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Jesus said, you're going to do more because I'm not going to be here. And my spirit will live in you, and you're going to do even greater things. Not, I mean, it's not about being greater than Jesus. It's about doing greater things so that the glory of God is revealed. But if I just walked in one day and just said to you, you know, um, you know I, I'm, I'm kind of going to do this and that, and I kind of gave you this statement, you know, and, and I'm going to do even greater things, you know, better than Jesus, you would all laugh that off. But what I want you to know in John 14 is don't you dismiss these words. Don't dismiss them. I know that the mightiest thing Jesus ever did for me was to save my life. I know that. And it, it was a miracle. But I also know there might be someone here today that the mightiest work that's coming your way now is in your home, is in your marriage, it's in your finances. And it's going to be a miracle. It's going to be incredible what God can do. I love what Paul said in Colossians. Colossians chapter one, Paul, I'm not gonna read all of it, but he basically says in, in the greatness of God, Christ is in you. And I have to tell you this, when Christ is in you, Christ is happening in you. It's not like, well, I got saved in 1964 and I haven't done anything since. That's not it and you need, you need some help. Because that's not it. Christ in you, then Christ gives you his heart in return. You give him your heart, he gives you your heart. He's going to grab that tongue of yours. He's going to say, be quiet, don't talk, don't do it. He's going to grab your ears and say, why don't you just kind of be quiet and listen for a little bit. He's going to grab your heart and say, we're not going to think like that anymore, pal. Because Christ.
Christ is happening. No, 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 no. He's happening. He can't, he can't stay still within us. He's, it's happening. And I know sometimes, y'all, that these kind of messages are, can go negative for you. And I understand that. I do. I get it. You know, you get a negative connotation or, you know, you see some preacher on TV or whatever saying, you know, for $19, I'll get you some water from the Jordan River. Or buy some uh, oil here from Bethlehem for $22. And I'm like, pal, I bought it while I was over there. Hush. And so you get real, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean. And then all of a sudden you're like, you you just got this negative connotation about whatever, about preachers. You know, even preachers, yeah. Even though you got the best looking one in town, and it's not Kyle. Everybody said, are you talking about Kyle? No. So here's what I want to tell you today, right now. Let's close it out. There's two little things I want you to remember today. One, be open to a miracle. This Christmas, would you be open to a miracle? in your life? Would you be open to the possibility that God wants to bend history to reach you for a supernatural good in your life? I know you feel stuck. I know that happens, and and, and I know that you can't solve all the problems that are coming your way in life. Believe me, I know. But it's God's way Maybe God is speaking to you right now, and what he's saying to you is this. I'm, I'm still here. I love you, and I'm going to love you forever. The idea of a miracle can be so delicate, and I know that. I know that. I know that. You've prayed for a miracle. You did not get it. You did not get it. And you hear of the extravagant answers that people get and you're so you you know you're happy for them but let's let's be just a little honest today just a little honest and sometimes you're happy for them but you're still thinking what about me and then that question surface surfaces well if you just had a little more faith just had a little more faith just a little more you just have a little more. And so you begin to struggle with that. What does that mean? God was, I, you know, did I do something wrong, God? Did, did, did I not pray the right words? Did, did I, you know, did, what, you know, is there a code word, Lord, that I don't have? Is, is it pray fast or is it pray fast? That was funny, but I'll let it go. I'll let it go. I want you to be, I want you to be open. And here's the second thing right now right now in this moment would you be part of the miracle would you be part of the miracle I I know you're familiar but I've got to remind you that when Jesus fed 5,000 people with a happy meal I want you to know the little boy had to be a part of the miracle and I want you to know that Jesus didn't distribute the food. The disciples did. Everyone had to be part of the miracle for it had happened. When Lazarus was in that tomb and Jesus was calling him out, I want to remind you, Jesus, if you'll read the Bible, you'll see Jesus was talking to Martha at one point and he said, you get the stone out. You get, you, you get it out of the way. Get the stone out of the way. He was talking to Martha. And she gets it out of the way. However that happened. And then he told Lazarus' friends, take all those cloths out, out, you know, off him. You're about to see a miracle, a miracle of God. And so they do it. But they were part of the miracle. A man is blind. And the only way he could see through Jesus is when he took that mud and he wiped it off his eyes. He had to be part of the miracle. And so I want to say this to you as we go, okay, as we close. God has not given up on you. And you need to hear that. Right now, you need to hear that. God has not given up on you. Yes. And I'm just thinking someone needs to know that. So here's what I want to invite you to. And you don't have to, and don't worry, we're not going to do a 75-minute anything, okay? And I know it's time to go and get your kids, but let's make them wait just a minute. Because this is a God moment. 
what I want to do is invite you to be part of the miracle. So right now in your life, all I want to do is if God nudges you, Alex, thank you for playing. He'll just keep playing. And I'm just going to invite you to come forward. No, no, you can kneel at the rail or stand um, and just take a moment to say, here's the first act of faith. I want to be part of the miracle. So I'm going to take a step of faith. And I'm going to declare this step in Jesus' name. And so when we do that, come. You don't want to do that? Don't. Just pray right where you are. But what I would like to do is for those of you who desire the supernatural working of God in your life, be part of the miracle. Make the first step. Declare it today. And so I invite you to come. Let this be a, a moment. I'll pray over us and send us out. Uh, I'm not going to, don't worry. We're not gonna, I'm not going to come back up here 12 times. I'm not going to do that. If you're ready, you come. Be part of this miracle. Today, as people pray, you're welcome to remain as long as you like. Online folks may want to send us a prayer request and we'll be praying for it. But I would just ask that as we, as we exit today, if people are still praying, hugging, loving on people, let that be part of the miracle. And may God bend history for your supernatural good. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen.